Hello everyone, my name is April and welcome to the Yoga Ranger Studio. Lucy is here with me to be supportive for this chat. It has been a number of years since I've had like a time to chat and I've asked for your questions. So I felt like it was definitely time for that. I did get some really, really good questions, which I'm, I appreciate. And thank you so much for those of you who wrote in to ask those questions. And I will be doing my best to answer them as completely as possible, right? So let's start with probably one of the one that I get asked the most often is when and where and how did I start my yoga journey, specifically yin yoga. And it's actually a really kind of interesting story. I've been practicing for a while at a local studio near me and they had a workshop one weekend and that workshop was a yin yoga workshop. And this was way, 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 way back in time. Think about 16 or 17 years ago. <laughs> it's been a really long time. It's been a really long time. And it was, um, I didn't even know what yin yoga was. I don't think anybody else that came to the workshop knew what yin yoga was either. But it was taught by a teacher who had just had a yin yoga workshop or training with Paul Grilly and she was so excited about it that she wanted to immediately kind of show people what this new thing was about. And so we get into these poses and this is a vinyasa and a power vinyasa studio. So I've been doing vinyasa flow for a, for a while there and we all came into this workshop and I was seated next to the owner who was taking the workshop as well because she knew nothing about yin. And we got into the poses and we were just holding them and holding them and holding them. And I had been taking restorative every single week and I just fell in love with yin yoga. It was, it just seemed so intuitive. It seemed so right. Now, a little background here. I am not someone with a background in dancing or gymnastics or any major flexible physical activity whatsoever. I am strong, but I am not particularly flexible. So this was a whole new world. I could see my issues with being really tight and tense melting away with this practice. And this was, uh, I think, a two, two and a half hour workshop. And by the time I was done with this workshop, I felt so good, so open, so loose, so calm, so centered, so in harmony with myself. I thought this is magical. As much as I love restorative, I love that this was that middle thing between restorative and vinyasa flow. So I could continue my vinyasa flow engage with yin to help with my flexibility and recovery and to really build a different kind of strength and a different kind of mobility. And then there was restorative for just really helping kind of heal my psyche and the stress and the strain of just life, right? So yin just called to me. It made intuitive sense. I kind of wondered why I'd never heard of yin before. <laughs> But it was really kind of new out there. There wasn't, there was nothing. There was, there was like, I was in Seattle at the time. There were no studios teaching yin at all. Now you can't find a studio not teaching yin. But then there was, there was nothing. And nobody even knew what it was or had ever heard of it. So very, very new and cutting edge. And from there, I just became fascinated and started practicing it on my own and then picked up a couple of books and started exploring it and then found a teacher that was offering a yin yoga teacher training and she was offering it in Albuquerque at the time, New Mexico. And so I went to visit my family and I took the yin yoga teacher training and it was amazing. Not that I expected anything else and life changing and so powerful. And I learned so much about myself and about my body and how to take care of myself. And I really, it's really just expanded from there. So I would say it was maybe just a couple years after that first introduction that I really jumped into yin yoga teacher training um, and just loved it. It was to me that, that missing piece. There was, 
There was vinyasa flow, hatha, there was power flow, and there was a blank space here. <laughs> and yin filled that, that void for me. And I could see over the, I have seen over the years, huge mobility changes in my body, huge comfort changes in my body, huge flexibility in my body. And I really, really believe that that almost all of it, a lot of it, is due to a yin yoga practice. Um, so definitely something that calls to me. I'm a very type A, very go, go, go. Um, very, very type A. So I really needed some things that were kind of stop, slow down, be still. And uh, the more I do it, the more I love it. So I've never stopped being absolutely in love with it. I've never felt a moment in my in my yoga career in which yin has not called to me in some way. And I always feel so grounded when I practice yin. And I can feel my body loves it. It just is a very intuitive practice for my body. So if that's the way you've been feeling, welcome, welcome to my world, right? <laughs> Such a great practice. Um, I love this question. This was really, really a great question. What would I tell myself as a yoga teacher with what I know now? This was hard. I had to come up with a lot. I was like all these things in my head. I would say the things um, most is that, you know, I remember hearing from, I, I'm pretty sure it was Jason Crandall who said this early on in my trainings. He said, let the practice and the poses do what they do. Now, as much as I felt like I was inexperienced and didn't know what I was doing and didn't have the right words or the right whatever and hadn't had enough teaching experience, um, this was a beautiful way to remember that it is not about me as a teacher. It is about letting this beautiful practice, the poses themselves and the experience of them do what they are meant to do, which is to move you, change you, shift your energy, change your expectations, shift your psyche. Um, they do that. And a good teacher is someone who facilitates the process of their students finding their own way, that empowers their students to tap into that intuition, to go inwards, to become body aware. We are just facilitators as teachers. We are people who are offering you something and you get to choose as a student how that works for you. And we're just helping as guides. We're just kind of helping you along the way, offering you suggestions and ideas and reminding you that you as a student are the best judge of what works and what doesn't work in your body and in your mind and in your practice. So I always remind people of that. It's, it's, Always remember that it, it can do its job. You're just helping, just holding its hand a little bit, giving it, giving it some direction. So be very open to that. For um, really getting the experience, the best way to experience this, and this is definitely Jason Crandall again, because I always remember everything he says, right? Um, he said, like maybe in the first class I ever took from him was, Always remember that your practice is your lab. So I know there are a lot of yoga teachers out there that say they don't have time for their own practice or it gets in the way or it's just too difficult. Please, please, if you are a teacher, be very prioritizing your own practice. And this means that when you're on the mat, I'll be doing a class and I will be practicing from my body and my moment in time and my mental state. And I will discover all these things and I will say, you know what? I bet this would make a great class for somebody else. This would be a really great pose for this. You discover so much in your own practice and it really helps you tap into the energy. It helps you move your body, calm your soul, calm your mind. And that energy radiates off your body to your students. It goes to your students. So your awareness of your body, your practice, your experience in the poses, knowing that a certain pose, if you hold it too long, it feels really not right. Or if you do this, it feels, you can offer those suggestions to your students. And there might be one out of 30 
that suggestion is a life changer. So your practice is your laboratory. So please prioritize your practice above other things. It really needs to, even if it's 15 to 30 minutes a day, you don't have to practice 90 minutes a day, okay? Uh, if you have time, please go ahead, but do some practice. Jump on your mat and do something with your body. Tap into that energy so that you can really guide your students. And also remember that you're a model for your students. So if you're not practicing, how are you expecting them to practice? If you're not checking in with your body and making modifications and choosing what's right for you, how do you expect them to do that? So really being that model for that and really shifting that energy. Other things I would really suggest if you're really early in your teaching career is to um, read a lot. There's a lot on online. There's a lot in books. There is a lot available to learn that is free and accessible or very low priced. Build your abilities there. Try things on. I like that words. Try things on. Try poses on. Try practices on. Try it in your own practice. Try it in a teaching setting. See if it works. If it doesn't, discard it. If it does, then you've got something new. Um, just always be open to new ideas and new perspectives and new ways of doing poses that you may have learned one way. There is no one way to do a pose. There are a million different bodies and all of them are gonna do that pose absolutely differently. And that's okay, right? Variations are the spice of life. So play with those. Um, what else would I tell myself? with what I know now. Yoga is a journey, not a destination. Yoga teaching is a journey, not a destination. And just because someone has 30 years of experience doesn't mean they're a better teacher than you. It could mean that they have had more time to learn stuff, maybe. Maybe they haven't learned it. Sometimes a teacher of 30 years might not have some of the insights that a teacher of five years has. So things are constantly changing. Keep yourself up to date. Sign yourself up for tons of newsletters and new things. Read, discover about anatomy, changes in how we see things, how we see the body, awareness, mental health awareness. Find ways to expand your horizons and include a lot more than just the physical practices or the poses or sequencing. Try new things, you know? toss things in the air. If you think that things have to be a certain order in a class and sequencing, switch your order around. Or sometimes I like to play with this. I like to take a pose early on in the practice. One that's really hard, like a hamstring stretch, have people practice it because it's really hard at the beginning of a practice and then have them come again at the end of the practice and come back to that same pose and then ask them to look at how that feels. How is this different? Inquire, allow people to inquire what's changing and allow them to see and feel those shifts in the energy. They will love yoga all the more for it at the very end, I'm telling you now. So those are some of the big things I would tell myself. Um, be kind to yourself, be compassionate. It's all gonna be okay, <laughs> right? You're gonna be fine. And you may know things that a 30 year teacher may not know. So give yourself, give yourself a little break. Give yourself a pat on the back for even doing it, right? Last thing, this was really interesting because I have seen a lot on YouTube lately, I kind of surf, on um, trauma sensitive or trauma informed yoga classes or somatic awareness or somatic yoga classes. And I, some of you may be wondering, and I, someone did ask this question, why I don't label any of my classes? Does that mean I don't have any classes that are with that lens, those lenses, somatic awareness, somatics as a whole, and trauma-informed or trauma-sensitive. And I thought long and hard about this, I did, um, because I have always included somatics and trauma-sensitive, trauma-informed yoga and meditation into my practices. They are woven into the fabric of the way I teach. So in my mind, somatics as applied to yoga and trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive as applied to yoga as a practice um, are not unique styles of yoga. They are methodologies of teaching. 
So they're an integration, what I consider an integration item. And this may be different for other people. I'm not saying it has to be that way across the board. But in somatics, we're really asking you to become more body aware. And I remember one of the first things I set out to do in my teaching at year one was my quest was to help my students become more body aware. That was it. That was my goal, my intention. And I still feel that that is a huge intention and part of the way I teach. Somatics is really becoming aware of your body, how it's functioning, what it's doing, how it's working, to really turning inward a little bit more, um, to intuitively adjusting and moving in ways that are more intuitive for your body. So inviting someone to modify a pose and to move their knee or shift it slightly to the left or to the right. Notice having, bring them back awareness to noticing how does that feel for you? What do you feel? What do you notice? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? You can always come in or out of it. You can lessen, you can deepen. That also feeds into trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive yoga. So here, we're really trying to empower people to take control of their own practice. We're giving them an opportunity and a space in where we're saying, this is your practice. You get to choose how it works. And I've always taught that way. I do not think that things have to be a certain way. I really feel like people should be feeling into their bodies. They should be doing what seems best for them. I try to offer lots of variations and modifications that will help support you in that. Um, offering you the opportunity to explore on your own, asking you to check in with yourself, check in with your breath, check in with your body, check in with your mind, noticing where you're at, what's coming up for you, and adjusting accordingly. Breathing through stuff, noticing where you're at and what is coming up, being in that space with it. All of those are related to these methodologies. I always tell you that the body that you have on the mat today is different than the body you had yesterday and you are working with this body here today. And that also is a lot about somatics in yoga and trauma-informed yoga as well. I really want you to remember first and foremost in all my practices that I offer is that I am just here as a guide and you do what you need to do for you best first and foremost and the best way you can serve yourself is to check in and check in and check in and notice what's happening. Don't stay in something when it hurts or you feel too much coming up. Make a choice to pull back out. There's no penalty for that. There's no penalty for going deeper. There's no penalty for using a prop. There's no penalty for using 10 props. This is about you and your practice, and it will always be about you and your practice from my perspective. And I want to offer you a space in which you explore. You explore and you're supported and you're offered that guidance of just like, try this, see how this feels, see where this takes you, see what comes up. I try not to tell you where you should feel stuff, that's actually really hard. You know, a lot of people in yin yoga are really focused on telling you where you should be feeling something. I often don't feel it anywhere where someone tells me I'm feeling it. So I try to say you might feel it here, or you might feel it over here, or you might feel it here. I don't want to tell you where you're feeling it because you know what? I'm not you, and I have no idea where you might be feeling it. So, or you might be feeling nothing at all. You'll hear me say that quite often. Maybe nothing's coming up. Maybe you feel nothing, and that's okay too. <laughs> right? You don't always have to feel something. You can feel nothing and that's a thing too. So I really interweave mindfulness, trauma-informed somatics, all of that together in my teaching. It's a methodology for me. It's not a style. So I don't put it as a tagline or a title for my classes because I feel like it's just a way of teaching. It's not a specific style. So I apologize to all of you who may be thinking that I have, I'm not offering these classes or I'm not teaching this way, or it may seem like I'm not aware of all these things. I truly am aware I, I have, and these, I would say, 
that probably 95% of my classes are very infused with this exact intention. Um, and the older I get, the further I practice, the longer I teach, the more these things just become deeper infused into my teaching style. So I do, I do offer classes that are with somatic awareness and trauma informed and trauma sensitive and they are all of the classes. I try very hard to be, to be those things, to, to, to infuse that into my teaching. So um, I hope that helps explain a few things for some of you that might not know that. Um, but those are just taglines. There's a lot of tag words that come in and out of the world and they're just a way to bring up an idea or a concept or a methodology that may have been kind of lower on everybody's value list and it's just bringing it up higher so that people are more aware of it and really focus more on it which i think is super important particularly for trauma informed and trauma sensitive we need to be really aware that a lot of people in our classes a lot of you a lot of us are dealing with different kinds of trauma and um, giving us agency, empowering us to make choices for our own practice, our own bodies, becoming more body aware, taking control of how we move in space and what that means for us is, is very, very helpful and supportive. So anyway, those were the biggest questions. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. If you're still here, thank you even more. Uh, that got a little bit longer than I thought it would be, but I'm hoping this will be a little bit of information about what people want to know. Um, if you have questions, I probably will do another one of these sometime. So you can always send those to me via email at the yoga ranger at outlook.com, or you can comment down below and let me know if you have further questions. I will put those on my list for next time, but this is it for now. So thank you so much for sticking by and having this chat. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for all of your support and kind words over the last few years as things have gotten a little bumpy and challenging and difficult and a little crazy in my life. And um, I will see you again very soon. Oh, I have one more question. A lot of people ask me, that. I just wanna run by. Nobody asked it specifically, but a lot of people ask me, how far in advance do I film my videos? I filmed them somewhere between four and five months in advance. So I have content already filmed up to four months in advance. So uh, when something happens, which I know something always does happen, I always have content already scheduled and ready to go. So there's less of a, um, less of a lag time for anyone and there's no downtime per se for either the members or the YouTube. I, I try very hard to kind of do that. And I'm presently about three and a half months out in filming. So if you request something, just know that I'm already kind of pre-scheduled and pre-filmed for three to four months. So it'll come, but it might be a few months. <laughs> so thank you for your patience in that. Have a great week. It was wonderful to chit chat with everybody and I will see you all again very soon.